After receiving his PhD in mathematics from the University of Notre Dame, <clears throat> Dr. Miller was a computer hacker for the National Security Agency for five years. Since then, as a consultant, he worked with Twitter's information security team, has won the Super Bowl of computer hacking four times, and has found countless vulnerabilities in Apple products, including their laptops and phones. Currently the senior security engineer at Uber's Advanced Technology Center, Dr. Miller has made waves within the field of automotive security <clears throat> excuse me, for his work alongside research partner Chris Valisak. He also spent considerable time revealing weaknesses in the field of automotive security, which led to the recall of 1.4 million vehicles. He's been featured on leading media outlets, including CNN, The New York Times, USA Today, and Forbes. And now he's here at Arm TechCon. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Charlie Miller. Hey everyone, thanks for having me here. I'm gonna talk about car hacking today with you. Uh, so that was a great introduction, but I'll tell you a little bit more about my buddy Chris who's in this picture. So he uh, did all the, the car research with me. And if you look really close in the background uh, of this picture, you'll see a Toyota Prius that we just bricked and it's stuck on the road. And that was Chris's way home, and that's why he's looking kind of unhappy in this picture. <laughs> um, so, so what am I gonna talk about? So I'm gonna tell you, uh, you know, we did some pretty cool research on cars, but we weren't the first people. So I'll, I'm gonna walk you through some of the other research that's been going on in the world of automotive security. Uh, and I'll talk about kind of cars in general and why, uh, at least at this point, they're inherently insecure. I'll talk about the Jeep, of course, since I know a lot about that. And then I'll talk about some other car hacks uh, that you might have seen in the news lately, and we can talk about those and how they compare to what, what we did and, and sort of the future of, of automotive security. All right, so car hacking basically started, uh, at least publicly, back in around 2010. So these researchers, academic researchers from the University of Washington and uh, University of California, San Diego, released a paper in 2010 called Experimental Security Analysis of a Modern Automobile. And basically what they did was uh, they took a car and they plugged into the OBD2 port in the car, this port that's federally mandated, it's underneath uh, you know, where your feet are in the car. And uh, they were able to, to send messages on the, to the car and make it do things physically. Uh, so they were able to do things like um, control the brakes and uh, control like silly things like windshield wipers or locks or something like that. And so, uh, it was sort of the first paper in, in, that made you think, oh my god, like there's a bunch of computers in my car, right? Until that time, at least I didn't even know that, that there were computers and networks in cars, right? It was like, this is a thing that took me from point A to point B. So this was like a pretty cool paper, but it was not well received. So this is one of the authors of the paper responding on Twitter to some comments. So uh, the academic world and the computer security world, um, their response was, well, sure, if you're plugged into a car physically, you can control the car, right? And it's just like if I had physical access to a car, I could cut the brake lines or, you know, put a bomb or whatever, right? So uh, the, the general response was like, this is, this is interesting, but in the end, it's not really, we don't really care. And so uh, this guy's response and the academics uh, response in general was like, oh yeah, well, we, we'll show you, right? Uh, we can do this remotely. And so they did. So the very next year, they released another paper this one uh, was called, in typical academic fashion, a Comprehensive Experimental Analysis of Automotive Attack Services. And so what this was, was the same car, this time they attacked it remotely. And then they were able to send a message to control things like the brakes and so forth. So uh, they actually showed three different ways that they were able to get code running on the car. Uh, the first was through Bluetooth. So almost any car nowadays has a Bluetooth connection between like your phone and the car. And this is what allows you to do hands-free uh, or you know, pipe music from your iPhone to your car or whatever. But the point is, there is communication from the outside world going into the car through this Bluetooth interface. They found a buffer overflow and they were able to exploit this uh, through the Bluetooth interface and get code running on the, the, the radio of the car and then they were able to control things like the brakes. Um, another way they did it, and this is kind of clever, they took a CD and they put a malicious MP3 file on it, and if you put it in the CD into a regular radio, it would just sound like music. But if you put it into their radio in their car, there was a vulnerability. They exploited it uh, to get code running. So uh, it was. Uh, you, you hear these stories about dropping USB sticks outside of a, a company to try to 
hack into their system as well. You could just drop CDs outside of a car lot or something and hope someone would put it in their car. Um, but the, so the Bluetooth was kind of cool, but the bad thing about Bluetooth attacks is you have to be within you know, 20, 30 meters for it to work. But the one that they found that was the most devastating was one through OnStar. So OnStar is a system in, in you know, certain cars that allow you to call for help or allow the, the OnStar people to like, you know, do something to your car, like unlock your, your, your locks if, you're, if you leave your keys in or whatever. And so they were able to find a vulnerability in the OnStar system where they could basically dial into the car remotely from anywhere uh, and take control of it. So that, that was pretty scary. And uh, the way they did it, I don't have a video of this, but it's, it was really funny. Like there was a, a you know, cellular modem essentially in the, in the head unit, in the, the OnStar system. And uh, they, they found the phone number. They essentially dial it up with a real phone, and then they have a speaker, and they put the phone up to it, and it's like, you know, making these modem noises, and they were able to compromise it that way. And it's like right out of a TV show. Um, but anyway, here is a video of, of them and their, uh, their attack. So, so they're uh, out there on a test track. He's going to remotely exploit the OnStar vulnerability and then send messages to the brakes um, to, to tell the brakes to change. And you'll notice the academics are a little more safe than us. They're on an actual track with a helmet and everything. My research is not quite as safe. So they're able to stop the car, which is pretty cool. Um, and one of the other things they could do um, that is, is pretty interesting is they could lock up individual brakes, so you could imagine locking up just the front left brake of a car, and that would probably make it do something pretty dangerous, I don't know. Um, so, so, so I read this paper, these two papers, and I was blown away. I thought this was really cool. It's something I wanted to do. And, uh, <laughs> and the, the, the problem was that they had basically done everything, right? Like usually when you read a paper and you want to continue research, you're like, okay, what did they not do? I'm gonna you know, finish up what they did. Here. They've done everything from, from, you know, from no access to remote compromise to controlling systems of the car. Like, they did it all. And so then I was, the only sort of minor criticism you could have is they didn't release any details. So they were under the, the belief that it was too dangerous to release the details of their attack. So they didn't say like, what bugs did they exploit? What were the vulnerabilities? What messages did they send to the components? Um, uh, they didn't even say what kind of car it was, right? Uh, so, so it kind of, from someone who wanted to start researching car security, it didn't help me at all, right? So they didn't have any code, they didn't have anything. Um, in fact, like here's some excerpts from their paper, and you'll see on the left there's these uh, you know bytes that show what the messages were, and they you know they x out the middle of the byte, so you can't just you can't go reproduce their work, for example. And then if you watch their videos of uh, of their talk that they gave, they actually block out the car. So you can't see what kind of car it is, um, and you can see on the like on the bottom right, it's like this big black blob that they're gonna they're gonna remotely exploit. And so, uh, you know, although we found out it was a it was a Malibu because if you're a super car nut, you can tell by little tiny details what kind of car it was. But anyway, uh, so so we're like, okay, Chris and I got together. And we're like, we're gonna do the same thing. Uh, well, there's two sort of questions, right? So was it just that one car that was vulnerable, or is it all cars, right? So we're gonna do a different car. Um, and then we're going to also, we want to get people involved, so we're going to release all of our findings, all our tools, and all that kind of stuff. So luckily this time there was this thing called DARPA Cyber Fast Track, and it was a program that DARPA set up to try to encourage small research projects like ours, instead of ones from like Lockheed Martin or something like that. And so they gave us a little bit of money so we could get a car and uh, do some research. Um, and we did. So we, we got a Toyota Prius, the one that we, we showed bricked in the, that slide earlier. Um, and then we got a Ford Escape. And the reason we picked those cars were uh, we wanted to have a car that had auto parking capability. Because the car that the academics used didn't have any kind of computer control of the steering. So we wanted that. And, uh, and it had to be the cheapest car possible <laughs> because it's government. So uh, we basically went to a car dealer and we're like, uh, yeah, do you have a, a Toyota Prius that auto parks? They're like, uh, yeah, yeah, what kind of color are we talking about? Like, oh, I don't care. Like, <laughs> well, uh, you know, do you want to have, like, you know, XM radio? It's like, I don't care. Like, just t show me a Prius, and if it can auto park, I'm going to buy it. And it was the easiest sale ever for a car company. <laughs> so anyway, so we bought these cars, and we basically replicated the research that the academics had done. If we were plugged into the car, 
Like we can send messages to make it do things. Um, so, uh, so we could control things like uh, the brakes and the windshield wipers and the locks and, and all this kind of stuff. And uh, so what this showed was now we knew at least three cars uh, could, we, you know, we could do this if you count the academics work. And so we, so the consensus was, okay, this is not just a one car problem. This is a, an industry wide problem. Uh, and, and the other thing that we did that the academics didn't do was now we had control steering because it's not like the academic researchers like didn't, couldn't figure it out. It's just their cars didn't actually have a computer controlling the steering, but we purposely bought cars that did. And not surprisingly, we could make those cars do things. Uh, that you could do. So here's a video of us with a Fox News reporter, and we're driving on the highway, and uh, we can we can we can kind of like jerkily control the steering. So it was it was like really inconsistent, but we could do it sometimes. And uh, this guy really made a huge mistake. So we were driving on the road, and uh, like I said, you would we would we would do the exploit, and sometimes it would work. Sometimes it would take like 30 seconds to work or whatever. And we're in the back seat, Chris and I, and he's in the front seat, and he's like, so you guys can control the steering? And we're like, yeah. Uh, and he's like, okay, show me. So Chris is typing on the computer, and he hits it, and I look up, and the, the Fox News guy takes his hands off the wheels. And I'm like, put your hands on the wheel! But it's too late. The car, like, goes out of control. So, anyway, Fox News reporter crashed. Not everyone can say they did that. But, <laughs> Uh, not unlike what happened to the academics, the response wasn't kind of what we wanted. We wanted their stuff to be like, oh my god, like cars are all, you know, having these these problems where you can control the physical systems. But the response was exactly what they got, which is, yeah, sure, if you're plugged in, you can do anything. It's like, oh my god, like the academics, they showed you can do it remotely. Like, do we have to redo everything they did? And yeah, we had to. Because you get responses like this from Toyota who are like, oh yeah, well, we really only protect the outside. Like, when, you know, we, we don't believe in a layered security approach. They didn't say exactly that, but they did. Um, they believe they're just going to keep the outside traffic out. And just to show they, even less that they understand what was going on, they're talking about how they have uh, state-of-the-art electromagnetic R&D facilities. It's like, well, this isn't caused by like a random fluctuation of an electromagnetic field. It's like a malicious attack. But anyway, so that was the response that we got. So like, fine, we're going to do it remotely too. So unlike the academics who did it the next year, it took us a couple of years. Uh, but we were able to do it against a Jeep. Uh, this was uh, now been like a year and a half ago. So we were able to remotely compromise uh, a Jeep. Uh, again, this was through, and I'm going to go into a lot of details about this, but this, this would affect the car anywhere in the United States. So you didn't have to be nearby the car. Uh, and the result was that, uh, Fiat Chrysler had to do a recall of 1.4 million cars, and which was pretty crazy. Um, and then, like, I don't know exactly what that means as far as company if Fiat Chrysler goes. Like, I don't know how much that costs, but there's some some people have said that it costs 14 billion dollars to do that recall. So it's like you could have hired a security consultant for a lot less than that. I, I would work for a tenth of that. I would have fixed it. <laughs> <laughs> and then. Like just instead of just picking on them, there was like other good things that came out of it. Like there's a you know possible there's some talk about passing some laws that, to to manage that, and this uh, has created really recently this cyber security best practices for cars that they want companies to follow. So there's like good that came out of this as well. Um, but then it, if you want to take a step back and say like okay, Chris and Charlie, we released everything. The vulnerability, the exploit, the code, the like tools, everything we did we released because we want to get other people involved because car research doesn't scale if we rely on Chris and Charlie to do all the work because I only have one car, right? Um, so, and then like the, the academic researchers, they didn't release anything. And so, like I don't know who was right, like who did the right approach, um, but the one piece of data that, that I will point out is that some of the bugs that they reported, the academic research reported, it took GM five years to fix. Um, for us, we gave Chrysler nine months of advance notice and told them, uh, hey, on this date we're going to release no matter what you do. And they, didn't, they, they kept saying they were working on it, but they never really did anything that we could see. Uh, but then as soon as the Wired article came out where we showed we could remotely compromise this car, like within a week it was fixed. Or at least the recall happened, I should say. So. Uh, in, in my opinion, that was the approach that got the, 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 the people most protected the, the quickest. All right, so we didn't stop there. That was in 2015. 
The next year, this last summer, we continued our research. So in 2015, we were able to remotely compromise the car, but we had only limited control of what we could do to the car. Uh, we, could, we could control the steering, but only if you're driving really, really slow. Um, and there's some other restrictions. Like we could control the brakes if you're driving really, really slow. So we wanted to see like how far could we have taken the attack. And we'll, we showed that we could actually control uh, the steering and the braking at any speed. So here's a video of, of that. We're, this is me controlling the steering of the car. Again, we're in a test track, just like that kind of researchers. Oh, no way, this is actually a, a school parking lot, sorry. So anyway, so we're able to control the steering of the car no matter how fast they're going. Um, so that's kind of, uh, you know, the, you can imagine the end-to-end the end, the end -end attack of set, compromising something and, and following it all the way through to controlling the steering. So it's, it's pretty scary stuff. So it begs the question, like, why do we all have these cars that are vulnerable, right? Like, why, why did it take these academic researchers or, or me and Chris or whatever to point this out and, and get the industry thinking about it? And it goes back to a problem that we have a lot with security, is that we build these systems and, and for a long time we don't think about security because we don't need to. And then all of a sudden we flip some switch and security becomes important, but we can't flip a switch and turn the security on. So, so cars did this too. So at one point in, in time, cars were just these things with wheels and engines and they took places, right? Um, but then we started adding features to them. So we added more and more things to them. So like windshield wiper, right? How does this work? Well, you've got this little stick on your steering column and you turn it on or a button or something and there's a wire that runs to a little motor that turns your windshield wiper. Okay, like how else would you do it? It makes perfect sense. Uh, and then you want to add more things like turn signals. So how do you do that? Again, you've got this little stick on your steering column and then there's wires that run out to the four corners of your car that control little lights that turn on if you want to turn to the left or the right or whatever. And again, you keep just adding more and more features and you've got a sensor that detects how fast your wheel's going and then that is a wire that runs up to your speedometer and it removes a little needle or whatever on your speedometer. So all these by themselves are fine, but what happens is as we add more and more features, you end up with wires running all over the car. And this is bad for a few reasons. One is that it's extra weight, right? You got all this copper wire or whatever running through the car and uh, every time you add any little bit of weight to the car, it's the car company has to buy that wire and uh, that costs a lot of money. When you're, It doesn't cost a lot for one car, but it costs a lot for a million cars or whatever they're making. Um, and then also, all that weight adds to like, makes your car less fuel efficient. And so there's a lot of reasons they don't want to have wires running everywhere. So the car companies all got together and uh, they, they came to a, uh, an agreement that they would all support this solution. This is like in the 70s, called the CAN bus. And the CAN bus is just a way that instead of running wires from every component to every component, you just run one set of wires to the components and they can all share that wire. And uh, they, there's just an agreed upon protocol that they can all talk to each other. And uh, the way this, this protocol works is it's called CAN and it's basically eight data bytes and uh, an identifier. And it's just broadcast to everybody. And so if you care about a particular ID as a component, like if you're the speedometer, you care about how fast the car is going. So if you see a message that it has the identifier of how fast the car is going, you pay attention to it and you set the speedometer. If you get some other message you don't care about, you just ignore it, right? And so this was fine, again, like I said, this was designed in the 70s. It didn't really matter if this was, you know, it doesn't have encryption, it doesn't have authentication or anything like that. It didn't matter, it's just like trusted things talking to trusted things. But then time went on, right? And we started adding a bunch of stuff to cars. So uh, we basically added two, two types of things to the cars. One was we, we started connecting cars to, to the outside world. So I already mentioned that Bluetooth connects you to the outside world. Um, Telematics like OnStar connects you to the outside world. Uh, but there's other things too. So like my, my Jeep had Wi-Fi. So that means my Jeep was a Wi-Fi hotspot, um, which means that if which was cool, like when my kid wanted to sit in the back seat and you know, play Wii or something. Not Wii, but DS, yes, I'm so old. But anyway, uh, play with their stuff on the internet, and they could do that from the back seat. But that also meant that my Jeep was on the internet, and also my Jeep was, you know, could be attacked contributed to that Wi-Fi hotspot too. So, so there's Wi-Fi in some cars, um, but most cars also have uh, these wire, wireless tire pressure monitoring systems. So this is a sensor that's in your tire. It's, it's telling the car how much uh, pressure is in your tire, that way you know if you're getting a flat. And so there's all these outside signals coming into the car. 
And each of these outside pieces of you know, data sources are a place where code can have vulnerabilities and uh, it can lead to, to compromise from the outside world. Well, that's fine. If you, if you just compromise some piece and then you can lie about how fast I'm going, it's not the end of the world. But the other thing that we added to cars recently, which then makes this an actual problem, is uh, all these like safety features. So there's this pre-collision system, for example, in my Jeep and a lot of cars. And the way that works is you're driving and it's got this little radar or something on the front. And if it detects that you're getting too close to something and, and you're going to hit it, it'll apply your brakes for you to, to save you, which is great. Um, it's going to save you a lot. But the problem is then that means there's a computer somewhere that can turn on your brakes, right? Uh, likewise, there's a feature called, well, you already heard that I was interested in auto parking. So this is a feature where you press a button and the steering wheel turns and it'll park you into a parallel parking spot. That's really convenient if you don't know how to drive your car very well, but it's, it does mean that there's a computer somewhere that can control your steering wheel. Um, and, and there's other ones, so adaptive cruise control. That is like regular cruise control, except instead of having to hit your brakes every time you're about to hit someone, the car will slow down for you. So there's computers that are in charge of how fast you're going, how, whether your brakes are on, your steering wheel. And so now you can, again, imagine chaining all this together where you got input from the outside world that could, that could compromise some component that, that, that then can talk to other components, and those other components may control features of the car that affect physical safety. So it's, it's you know, end to end, it's kind of a nightmare. And then you, you get to the point where cars even have web browsers in them sometimes. And it's like, we don't, I, I work in computer security for 10 or 15 years. We don't know how to secure web browsers, so let's not put them in cars, right? Like, can we disagree on that? Like, car security is bad enough without adding a web browser. So this is a BMW that uh, has a web browser. And I'll talk about a web browser and Tesla later on in the talk. That becomes problematic. All right, so I mean, cars basically suffer the same issues that all Internet of Things type devices have, uh, which is they're they were designed for you know trusted components, and everything was great. And then we, we were like, okay, I want my trash can to be on the internet now for some reason. And uh, oh no, like there's a security issue, right? It was shocking. So it's it's the same thing. Like as soon as you open up something that was all designed to be uh, trusted components on the internet, there can often be a problem. So let's talk about the Jeep uh, in more detail, since I know a lot about that. Uh, this is what the inside of my Jeep looks like. And again, like you definitely realize that thing in the middle is a computer. That's the thing that has the navigation system and it has like the radio and all that kind of thing. I mean, it looks like a computer. But as I mentioned, there's actually like 40 or 50 computers in your car. There's a computer that controls the anti-lock braking system. There's one that controls the airbags. There's one that controls, uh, I don't know, the transmission, right? So there's all these computers, and they're all talking to each other. But the one, this one in the middle, it's called the head unit. That's the main one that, that is, is important, because that's the one, at least in the Jeep, where most of the outside data in the world goes to. Um, and uh, as you can see here, I mentioned that it wasn't actually made by Chrysler. Like a lot of the things in cars aren't made by the actual car company. They, they, they buy them from suppliers. And uh, this was the, the actual head unit here was, was made by a company called Harman. So the screen, uh, as I mentioned, my car has, has Wi-Fi, which is pretty cool. Um, this is what it looks like. Uh, we, we looked at this, and uh, I found a vulnerability in it and the way that it processes uh, outside our data from the outside world. And just to show you the kind of security it had, um, I was, like Chris and I, when we did this project, we were like, I don't know, what's it gonna take, like a year to find, even to write a remote exploit, you know, and, and send messages to a, to a Jeep or whatever. So I was like, it's probably gonna take, I don't know, three or four months to find and, and write an exploit for this thing. So it turned out, it took, we, I poked around for like three weeks and I found this one and the, the exploit writing part, which I thought would take months, because that's how long it takes to write an exploit against like an iPhone or a, a MacBook or whatever. Um, it took maybe five minutes. So it was trivial. There was, there was like a, an outside interface that was facing the internet that, that uh, had a method called execute and that you could call, right, from the internet. And the way that this execute method worked was you would give it a command and it would execute it. Right, so, so I don't know if that's even an exploit. That's a, it's, a, it's a feature, not a bug. Right? <laughs> anyway, so, so, so getting code running remotely onto this head unit was like really easy. Um, so I'll show you what you could do just with that. 
So not even talking about sending messages to other components yet. Just like, what could you do if you exploited that head unit? Well, the first thing you could do, oh, and I might mention that here's the one tie-in to ARM technologies. That head unit ran an ARM chip. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't ARM's fault. It was, it was the, the code that was written on top of it. It wasn't even, so it was, a, it was running an ARM chip. It ran QMU. It wasn't even their fault. It was the code that uh, Harman had added on to that that had the problem. Anyway, uh, so you could, you could query that head unit and ask what the GPS information was for the car. So you could, you could follow the car as it drove around on the street, which was kind of fun. And here's some of the other things you could do. So here's me. Hey, Charlie, you ready to talk about your wires? I am. Let's so this is just showing we can remotely do the attack. Um, you can see like a magician has to show. There's no wires. It's all wireless. No computers. Hey, Charlie, give this car some style. So you can control what the screen shows. That's me and my buddy Chris in our, our super fly uh, jumpsuits. Excellent. Turn that up. So you can control the radio station. You can control the volume. We just turn it up to like match the volume here. And then you think these buttons and these dials actually do something, but these are just inputs to a computer, and we can ignore those inputs. And so he can't turn the radio down or change the station or anything. So he's, he's stuck with the R&B. But the, he's like, well, we'll just reboot the car, and then that'll fix it, right? So that's what you do for Windows computers. <laughs> but no, for cars, it doesn't actually work. So we, can, we still have control of the car even after a reboot. So this is uh, attacks against the head unit. Like, this is really fun, and, and if you want to attack my head unit, go for it. It's, it's, it's fun, and you know, we can have a gentleman's agreement to, to stop there. The danger is really when you start to, to send the messages to the other components, which I'll get to in a minute. But before I do that, I just want to talk about like, why we could attack a car anywhere in the United States. And uh, the reason was because inside that head unit, there's a, there was a cellular modem, and it was on the Sprint uh, carrier network. And Sprint's smart. Like If I just sat down at my computer at home, and I tried to scan the internet and find vulnerable cars, like Jeeps, uh, I wouldn't be able to do that because Sprint has a firewall and they don't let inbound traffic or traffic from the outside internet into their Sprint network. Um, so, it, so it wouldn't have worked. But what they do allow is Sprint one Sprint device to talk to another Sprint device. And so, if you, so we bought the Sprint phone um, and then that Sprint phone can then scan Sprint's network and find all the vulnerable cars. Um, and so we tethered the internet, you know, we use that as the internet for our laptop and then we could just scan Sprint network and find vulnerable vehicles, and we could have exploited them if we wanted to. So that was a big mistake on their part. And at this point, we had already told Chrysler a long time ago, but they kind of weren't telling us anything. So they wouldn't tell us what what different cars were vulnerable, what years were vulnerable, that sort of thing. So we're like, okay, well, uh, we'll just find out for ourselves. All right? We'll just scan the internet and find all the vulnerable cars. And so we did. So we wrote the scanner. And it would scan, and then it would find, uh, if it found a vulnerable car, it would ask what the VIN number was, and from the VIN number, you can find out what kind of car it was. So you have a scanner, and the output is things like, you know, 2013 Dodge Ram 1500 Longhorn. It's like, wow, it's crazy. So we scan and scan, and we found, these are all the cars that we found that were vulnerable. Um, and some of the interesting things to point out is, at the time, uh, Chrysler was saying it was only 2014 cars that were vulnerable, but as you can see, if you actually look at the data we found, we found 2013 cars and 2015 cars that were vulnerable. And when we talked to them about that, their response was something to the effect of, oh, that was just a screw up at one factory or something. So, I mean, this is like a case where you really got to look at the data and not just trust what, what companies say. So, uh, so these are, these are some of the cars we found that were vulnerable. And the one that was like, like, I'm a, I'm a good guy. Like, I did this research for good. Um, but the one time I was tempted was when I found that Viper. It's like a, like a hundred twenty thousand dollar car, and I could just change a radio station so easy. But I didn't do it. But it was it was tempting. All right. So at this point, we could remotely exploit any of those cars' head units and change the radio station or whatever. But what else can we do? So uh, if you look at the wiring diagram, this is our version of a wiring diagram for the car. Uh, the radio itself is connected straight to the bus the CAN bus that all the important components are on. So it's like, this should be really trivial to, uh, to finish up and send the messages that we want. It turned out it wasn't. It was a lot harder. Uh, inside the head unit, there's actually two chips. The one on the left is the ARM chip. Uh, the one on the right is a V850 chip. And the ARM chip itself 
uh, couldn't actually send CAN messages. It wasn't allowed to. There was not a direct connection to the CAN bus. And so probably there was an engineer at Chrysler who was like, oh yeah, you know, like our cars can't be hacked because the outside connections don't have direct access to the CAN bus. And he was right, or she. But uh, it, he or she actually wasn't right either. So there was like, there's a connection between the two chips, right? Um, the, the chip that I'm, I have code execution on and the chip that can send the CAN bus. There's, they are able to talk to each other. And it turns out that the chip on the left can reprogram the chip on the right. <laughs> so, uh, so you can remotely attack a car, uh, reprogram that V850 chip, and then reprogram to say, I don't know, send whatever CAN messages you want. And that's exactly what we did. And this was another mistake that Chrysler made that they should have only allowed signed firmware images from Chrysler. They could have verified that all that code only came from Chrysler, but they didn't, so we changed it to do whatever we wanted. Um, the bad thing is, like if you're exploiting something, it's one thing, because usually if you just return the car, you, you, it'll fix itself if you mess something up. But if you're reprogramming the firmware of a chip and you mess that up, it's really bad. And that's what happened a few times. So I would, I would screw up reprogramming that second chip, break it, and then my head unit wouldn't work anymore. And then what are you going to do except go to the dealer? So <laughs> here I am at the dealer three times. I was there with my busted head unit. I mean, it was a real lemon. I mean, I think broke all the time. <laughs> uh, but they, they were very nice. They fixed it up and got me back on the road. And then eventually I figured out how to program it without messing it up. Um, so thank you, Chrysler, and their warranty system. <laughs> so eventually then, we could remotely attack the car, reprogram that second chip, and then send CAM messages to the other components of the car. So here's an example of what we could do. Uh, we can make the brakes not work. This, so my buddy Chris here, he's going to try to press the brakes here in a second. So he's pressing the brakes, so you can see we're not actually stopping. So, so this attack actually only works if you're going quite slow. So it's not, it's scary, and like if you were at a traffic light or something, you would go out to the middle of the intersection, so it's kind of scary. But it's not like you're driving down the highway and the brakes won't work, which would be even worse. So that was good on their part. They had, they had it actually programmed into the brakes not to uh, allow these kind of messages if you were driving faster than, I think, five miles an hour. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, we were able to, and they had the same sort of mechanisms for the steering. They had things built in to make it to where the steering wheel, you can't turn it while you're driving on the highway. Like, it knows you should only auto park if you're driving slow. But like I said, in that year from 2015 to 2016, we figured out ways to bypass all that. And so here, uh, here is like the worst case scenario for the Jeep. So driving down, the, down this country road, and uh, I take over the steering from Chris. He tries to keep it on the road, but fails. So we actually crashed off the side of the road there, which was, this is one of the fun things about doing car hacking, is we didn't really want to do that, but it was kind of cool that it happened, right? <laughs> so we were stuck, we, so we, we were on this farm road, and there's this ditch on the side of the road, and uh, our car was kind of at a 45 degree angle stuck in this ditch, and we couldn't get out. We're like, now what do we do? And it's like, I don't know. And uh, this cop came by after a while, and he's like, uh, you guys didn't go in the corn, did you? I was like, no, no, we're just in the ditch. He's like, okay, he just took off. <laughs> so, yeah, thanks. But then eventually some other person came by uh, who, who pulled us out with his pickup truck, which was nice. <laughs> and the, the other sort of funny part about that story is this road, I don't know if you can really see from that video, but it's like five miles perfectly dead straight uh, and nothing around. So there's no reason you should end up in a ditch on this road. And so the guy's like, you know, like, how'd you end up in a ditch? And we're like, eh, it's kind of a long story. He's like, I gotcha. Like, totally respected our, our privacy, and he was up for discretion in there. Um, so, uh, like, the first sort of takeaway from all this is like, why the hacker is things that talk to the outside world connected to Canvas? Like, let's just separate that, and that'll solve all our problems. Well, the problem is if you do that, you lose a bunch of features that you might want. And so one of these features is called speed compensated volume. And what that means is as you drive faster, the volume on your radio will naturally turn up to kind of compensate for uh, the actual, you know, extra wind speed and uh, wind noise and engine noise and stuff like that. Um, and the way that works is that means your radio has to know how fast you're going, and the way that it knows how fast you're going is it reads messages off the CAN bus. So if you want this feature, you got to have it connected. Um, that feature's not that great, like I could live without it, but there's other features people really do want. And so if you live somewhere that gets cold, 
uh, you probably want this feature. So there's ways with your, your iPhone, you want to be able to turn on your car while you're sitting inside and let it warm up. And the way this works is you press a button on your iPhone, it calls up to some cloud service that then calls down to the car, or the car maybe calls the cloud service, whatever. But eventually the thing that's talking to the internet in the car has to be able to tell the engine to turn on. And the way it does that is with the CAN bus. And so not only does the, the radio or the head unit have to be able to read CAN messages, it needs to be able to send CAN messages too. Or you lose features like that. And the one feature that I really actually like, and I don't want them to, to make go away, is this like feature where you're in reverse and you, you turn the steering wheel and it draws these little lines on the screen that show you exactly where you're going. Super cool feature. But the bad news is it means that it has to know what your steering wheel is up to. And the way it knows that is by reading CAM messages that the steering wheel is sending to the head unit. So as long as we want these kind of features, and we're going to get more and more of these features, right? We're going to get even more connected to the world. There's going to be uh, vehicles communicating with other vehicles to know like traffic conditions, and vehicles talking to traffic lights and other infrastructure. And so we're going to get more and more connected. We're going to have more and more of these, these features. And so it's just not really an option to disconnect it. We need to just figure out ways to actually secure things and let things be connected still. All right, so that was uh, Chris and I's work and, and the economics work. So what about other things you may have seen in the news, and, and let's talk about those, just so that when you leave here, next time you see a headline about car hacking, you'll know exactly what they're talking about. So uh, one that was kind of cool is uh, this guy, Sam, Sammy Camcar's uh, own star, instead of on star. Uh, do you guys know, Sammy is a pretty cool researcher. He did the thing called the, the MySpace worm. Do you remember that? Anyway, I'll tell you what that is real quick. So in MySpace, which was, I don't know if you guys even know what that is anymore. Um, <laughs> it was a thing like Facebook. Um, but it had this, this feature on the side of your screen where it was like, my hero is, and you would put, you know, Death Leopard or whatever, whoever your hero is. Um, but he found this cross-site scripting bug that changed that. If you visited his page, it would change your page to say, my hero is Sammy. And then if anyone visited your page, then you, their page would change to say, my, my hero is Sammy. And so uh, after like a very short amount of time, that's how exponential things work, everyone's page said, my hero is Sammy which was really awesome, I thought. But uh, MySpace uh, didn't think it was awesome, and then he actually got arrested and went to jail for that, which was a bummer. But uh, now he's out and doing good guy research. Uh, so good, good for him. Uh, but anyway, what he did for this, this OnStar thing, and we see a lot of this kind of thing, is car hacking is like really hard. Like what I described to you that we did, uh, if you count all the way back to the, the Ford Escape and stuff, that was essentially four years. But just on the Jeep, we spent two years doing it. But something that people like me are really good at doing very quickly is looking at mobile apps. And so he found a vulnerability, and I mentioned mobile apps sometimes let you press a button and turn on your car or something. He found a vulnerability in the mobile app for, uh, for this OnStar service that it, they didn't use SSL or anything like that. So if he saw you press the button on your app, if he was on the same network, he could see your password or credentials go over the wire. Then he could do that later. So he, could do, he couldn't send arbitrary messages on the canvas or anything like that. But he could do whatever your app was allowed to do. Like, he could remote start your car, he could lock your car or unlock it, he could turn on the horn and that sort of stuff. And so, the vulnerability wasn't with the car itself, it was with the mobile app. So that's kind of interesting that it's like car hacking, but you're limited to whatever you know, the mobile app can do. And the good thing about this is, they couldn't really fix the Jeep very easily, um, but you can fix this pretty easy because you just get a new version of the app downloaded to everybody. Uh, I can tell you the, the way that they ended up fixing the Jeep it's kind of a nightmare. So they did the recall, but people don't really listen to recalls that much. Um, they also mailed out USB sticks to people, so they would update their car themselves in theory. Um, and then what they also did, which actually fixed the problem the best, was they had Sprint change that thing to where uh, one Sprint phone could talk to another Sprint device. Uh, and once they did that, even if a car was still vulnerable, I, no one could attack them anymore. So that was the actual fix that fixed it. But anyway, it just goes to show how hard it is to fix cars when, when they're uh, when they're busted as opposed to like mobile apps. All right, so another thing that's a problem is uh, old flow here. It's like if you, you can buy these dongles for, for different reasons, enterprise control, enterprise management, or for your insurance company, you plug it into your car, and then it sees if you're driving too fast or if you're applying your brakes too hard, it knows that, and it phones home to Progressive or whoever and says this guy needs to have like his insurance rate jacked up. <laughs> But of course this means you've got something on the internet that needs to phone home to Progressive and it's plugged directly into an interface that both us and the academic researchers initially plugged into. So it's, uh, and it's probably not written by someone who's as good as, say, Chrysler, right? 
Um, and so some researchers, some of the academic guys again, some other guys from some other companies, they, sh they found three different dongles. They're all vulnerable and uh, they allowed you to do whatever you want. So just like for us, like once you exploit that thing, you can send CAM messages, it's over. You can start messing with the brakes and steering and all that. So this is really bad. And of all the things that people ask me, like, hey, Charlie, how do I protect my car? You know, I'm scared my car's gonna get hacked or whatever. Like there's not really anything you can do. It's not like you can download antivirus or something. But the one thing you can do is don't put these in your car, right? It's not worth saving 50 bucks on your insurance to have your car vulnerable to attack. <laughs> Um, other things you may have heard about. So about the same time that Chris and I were doing uh, the, the, the first Jeep attack, some guys uh, came out and they hacked the Tesla, right? But they didn't actually hack the Tesla. What they did was they took a Tesla and they ripped it apart and they got the firmware off it and they found uh, passwords that would allow you to like log into it or whatever. And then they found this other physical port that if you plugged into, you could log in. And then, so with physical access, they could plug in and then they could control things. They couldn't send messages on the CAN bus. That was, that was uh, something they, they didn't know how to do. But they could do whatever the, the computer could do. So it's the equivalent of what we did with the, the first step of our attack, right? So we could control the radio. So they could change the radio station. They could control the windows and the locks because they had buttons on there to do that. But they couldn't, for example, control the brakes, right? So this is, they, they had done basically step one of the two-step attack that's necessary to, to like, do the really crazy, scary stuff. That's a good start, uh, but it's just it goes to show you, like when you read a headline that says Tesla hacked, like you really need to understand the differences of car hacking and how that matters to know that this isn't the same threat that the academics or that, that we did against the Jeep. But these guys did do the same work. So this is pretty recent, like maybe a month or two ago. These researchers from China, they were able to hack the Tesla um, legitimately. So what they did was they found a vulnerability in the head unit uh, in the web browser. So Tesla's come with web browsers. If you surf to uh, a malicious page in that web browser, they're able to get code execution. So this isn't as dangerous as the one that the other ones because the one that Chris and I did, we could just scan the internet and find them and attack them, right? It didn't require the user to do anything except have the car on. Um, here, you have to have the user do something. So it's not as scary in that sense. But the thing they did do was they were able to then do that second step. They were able to do exactly what we did. They reflashed this gateway module that then allowed them to send CAM messages and they were able to do things like control the braking or uh, I don't know if they did the steering, but they probably could have. So they, they did the end-to-end -end attack just like we did, except that uh, there's required some user interaction. Um, just to show the difference, so what Jeep fixed, when they fixed our vulnerability was they essentially just shut down the services that had the vulnerabilities, right? Which is fine. But they didn't ever fix, as far as I know, that second piece, the code signing piece. So if I could find some way to hack a Jeep, I could still do that reprogramming and send the messages. What Tesla did, which was better, was they actually changed that second piece to where you had to do the code signing, right? So now these, these uh, Chinese researchers, if they were able to find another web browser vulnerability, which I'm sure they can because the web browser is full of vulnerabilities, um, they could no longer do reprogram that gateway because it has to be only be signed code by Tesla. So that was a, a much better fix. And the other thing Teslas do that's really cool is they can actually auto-update over the air. So Te Jeep had no way to fix all the vulnerable cars. They, they, were, they had to send out recalls that said, hey, bring your car in, get it fixed. But Tesla can actually just push out updates over the internet to the cars and fix them all overnight if they want to. And that's what they did. They, they pushed out this fix that required code signing to all the cars. So, pretty cool. Um, some other things you might have heard about in the news, there's this hack against Nissan Leafs. Leafs. So again, this was more of a mobile app kind of vulnerability. So uh, there was a mobile app, and it, you authenticate to a server, and then you could do things like turn on the heater, or uh, heat the seat, or whatever like that. The problem here was it wasn't an SSL issue like Sammy's. It was that the password the authentication to the server was the vehicle, identific vehicle identification number. And so if you know anything about cars, you know if you want to find the VIN of a car, you just walk up to it and you look through the windshield and it's written right there. So if you saw a Nissan Leaf, you could just read the VIN and then you could log in as that owner and like turn on the heated seats, for example. Which is, I mean, it's sort of fun, right? Uh, the only problem was with Nissan Leafs is it's an electric car. And so if you were like to overnight turn on someone's heated seat when they woke up the next morning, their car like wouldn't start. 
because it's dead, like it's out of batteries. So that's, that was like a denial of service against the car right there. <laughs> but it wasn't physically dangerous, right? You couldn't send messages to the brakes or anything like that, but it's, it's sort of fun, and I think we're gonna see more and more of these kind of attacks because it's relatively easy to find these. Um, you might have read articles about all these cars getting stolen, right? These high-tech hackers are stealing cars. And at first I read, you know, just like you, I read this headline, I'm like, whoa, like, what did they do? They like remotely attacked the car and like unlocked it and turned it on, like that sounds really cool. But if you read the details of what it is, it's not as cool. So what, the way that these attacks work is someone who works at like a dealership or something gets, a, gets the software that they use to reprogram keys. So like, if you lose your key to your car, you can go to the dealer and they'll give you a new key that works, right? That's, they have software that will program keys for you. So someone gets a hold of that software, they go to your car, they find out what the VIN is or whatever, they repro and they have a spare key, they reprogram the key with that software, and then they can just open up your car and drive away. So that's how that works. So it's really, it was uh, sort of a feature of, of the software that you could do that. Like, they, they keep that software under lock and key, it's, it's very protected. Like, I, I had all their software that you could get for Jeeps, and they don't let me, for example, get that software that lets you reprogram keys. Only the dealers can do that. But um, obviously, there's a lot of dealers, and you can't trust them all. So this was just, uh, it wasn't really hacking, I would say. It's more like just using, it's like stealing software or something. I don't know. But anyway, it's, it wasn't quite as, as sexy as I thought it was going to be. Um, one more thing. So, so there's some research came out recently uh, about heavy trucks. So, so um, the messages that you send on the CAN bus to say control the brakes or the steering, they're different for every car. So if you figure out a way to control the Jeeps, for example, steering, and you try that against a Ford, it's not going to work. All those messages are all different. And you know, we know this because we, you know, Chris and I have looked at a Toyota, a Ford, and a Jeep. Totally different messages every time. But heavy trucks are different. So if you buy, uh, if you happen to have a, you know, a Mack truck or something, and you, you look at all the messages that are being sent to the brakes or the steering or the windshield wipers or whatever, and then you compare that to a Peterbilt, or you compare that to some other kind of truck. Uh, those are all the same, because those, those heavy truck companies have gotten together and agreed on a standard. And so that's like really cool if you want to build a truck, because you can just pull an ABS system out of one truck and stick it in another completely different truck, and it's going to work, because all those messages are the same. Where that wouldn't work, if you, if you took a Ford ABS and put it into a Jeep, it wouldn't work at all. So that's really convenient for them, but from an attacker's perspective, it makes things a lot easier too. Because now, like one of the things that limits, like someone's like, oh, some like, you know, Russian attackers are gonna, you know, stop all our cars or make all our cars crash. And I'm like, well, probably not. Uh, because every car is so different, it would be so hard to figure out how every single car worked. Like if it's just one guy, then man, maybe they're gonna attack one particular kind of car. But with trucks, it's a different story. So trucks you can attack, uh, if you figured out some message that would make all the trucks crash, uh, you could do that and it would work against all the different trucks. So that's pretty scary. And this is something we knew about, but these researchers actually got trucks and school buses and stuff and proved it. So that was kind of cool. Okay, so that is like all the, the, the car hacking that you will have seen in the news. Uh, so you're up to speed. You're as good as I am on this now. Um, but sort of the, the lessons that, that you can learn is that cars were always insecure, but it didn't matter because they weren't connected to the internet or to the outside world. But as soon as we connected them and we allowed inside our input from the outside world, from attackers, for example, to, to be processed by them, that really opened up the security risks. And then when we also added in physical control features, then that, that whole chain can be pieced together to, to cause sort of dangerous situations where cars could get hacked and then actually like crash or something. Um, the other thing is like if you read an article and it says like, so and so car got hacked, like you, you need to read the details to know exactly what they're talking about. Are they talking about you can control the, the heat or the seat? Or are they talking about you can control the steering, right? It's, it's totally different ways. And the worst types of messages are the ones, of course, or the worst types of attacks are the ones where uh, you can actually send the CAN bus messages because then you have a lot of control over the actual features of the car. So, so basically, like, we're not in a great place now, and the reason that Chris and I did this research was we don't want to wait until cars are getting hacked and crashed because it takes so long to design a car, we don't want to wait four years, right? So, trying to get ahead of the curve now, like, communicate to car manufacturers to, to think about security and design it from the beginning, and we don't really know if it's working. Car companies don't talk to me, they don't talk to any of us really about the security of their cars. They just say, trust us, they're secure, we take security seriously. Um, hopefully, 
I, like the biggest thing I want to see is, I, I, first of all, I want them to be working on security, and second of all, I want there to be more transparency into like how do they design their cars to be secure? What kind of attacks do they consider? So I would love to see, like Microsoft does this, I would love to see white papers written by uh, car companies and saying exactly how their system's designed for security and uh, you know, what, then I could spend a weekend reading their white paper instead of spending two years you know, tearing apart their car. So anyway, hopefully things will get better. We're not in a good shape now, but uh, I have high hopes for the future. Thanks.